It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Manuka Singh, consultant for the Colburn Institute of Inclusive Leadership at Norquest College. Manuka is representing Norquest College today as our second corporate deluxe sponsor for the conference and a longtime organizational partner to our organization. After a brief video, Manuka will tell us a little bit more about Norquest College and will introduce the next session. So Manuka, welcome. I did actually acknowledge you this morning, but you were, you were but now you're here. So if you don't mind coming up. So at Norquest, we have sort of two opportunities for students to get into energy. So we have the Energy Management Diploma, uh, which is a two-year diploma, and then we also have a Energy Advisor prep course. I come at it from a carpentry standpoint, so I, I look at it as far as framing, and this is what an energy advisor has to learn. So there's lots of, lots of movement in, in and out of this. Energy management can't just be for the elite. If you are uh, from the BIPOC community, there are supports for you to come to Northwest and do this program. And as somebody who has worked in this field as a woman, as a person of color, as, as a queer person, it is also extremely rewarding to be able to represent the people who are most important to me. Everybody, can you hear me? Well, I better be more fashionista. I don't know if this fits. Thumbs ups or thumbs down. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah, presence is very important in how we, uh, how we uh, you know, come into a room and uh, uh, own that room as well. So um, I wanted to start off with, I usually write my speeches down in handwriting, but I actually put it on uh, a phone today, which is rare of me. Um, so I'll use my phone as a guidance. So I want to first thank Doug and Elena. They've been partners of Norcross College for years and you know, professional and personal partners of mine as well. So Doug and Eric, Eric and Elena and the team for the opportunity for Norquist College to participate in this great global talent event. Uh, at Norquist College, if you don't know who we are, I'll say a little bit about us and talk a little bit about the Institute. At Norquist College, we have a unique ability to provide students with the skills Alberta needs in a supportive and inclusive environment. Also, we get this input from industry, business, and public sector. We make the le learning relevant and rewarding. We serve around 12,000 full-time and part-time credit students and about 7,900 non-credit or continuing education students. So that's us as a college high level. Um, I'm representing the college in the Colburn Institute of Inclusive Leadership. So the Colburn Institute for Inclusive Leadership is a department in the research and academic innovation. And we are recognized as a leader nationally provincially, locally, in customized equity, diversity, and inclusion solutions that supports individuals, teams, organizations, and communities on their unique equity, diversity, and inclusion journeys. We are committed to collaborating with you to develop, support, and sustain EDI through a variety of ways. What does that mean in terms of the program? So I gave you a little bit about who we are. So I'll tell you, tell you a little bit about the program. So the program that I'm here to talk about is the Energy, Energy Advisor Program. Uh, it's an exam preparation course, which is funded by the federal government, Natural Resources Canada, which really allows a person to get into the industry of the energy sector. Your tuition fees are fully covered for qualified learners. Some questions to consider as you're maybe considering a career as an energy advisor. I'll just throw them out to you. Are you a self-starter? Are you somebody who has a desire to improve in uh, energy efficiency in homes? Are you somebody who's interested in home construction? Do you have a background in construction, engineering, home inspection, plumbing, mechanical? Are you somebody with great communication skills, entrepreneurial spirit, somebody who's analytical, technical, somebody who likes to make decisions and problem solve? Or are you just maybe looking to get into a new career path and a stepping stone of the energy field? If you consider doing the program with us, we'll help you prepare to write the two na national exams that'll help you get into the field. So it's an exam preparatory course over four weeks. Um, really, what does the work look like? It's a lot of in-office, a lot of in-field work going to people's homes, assessing their homes, 
making sure that you know people's homes are going to be more energy efficient. I've got my team member at the back, Joy, back there at the orange shirt. If you have, uh, if you need the information for or the program, we just finished our second cohort uh, last week, and we're starting our third one, and we've got a fourth one starting in September. So you know, if you're considering the career of energy advisor, also in the program, the Coburn Institute is hosting the program. So. We actually have workshops for the employer partners that we have. We've got about six employer partners. We set up students with employer connection sessions to help you meet new employers, get to know them, get to network. And we also provide you with some technical skills with some in-field files where you go into the field and do the actual job. Um, and our institute actually supports in many ways. Uh, the program is really for underrepresented groups. So that is one big part of the program. We're trying to get more people into the field of energy, support people with getting new jobs, uh, have good incomes. And we have some programs, within the program, there's some uh, courses on learning about equity, diversity, and inclusion, looking at why it matters, why it's important to have that, that, uh, that, that as part of your business. So that's part of it. So anyways, I'm going to probably be silent for a second. I uh, just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity. I'm really humbled to be up here. Um, it's a blessing. Um, you know, Doug and his team are amazing. And, you know, they've actually been amazing to me because I've been a mentor in the previous years with Eric. And I'm looking at being a mentor again with Eric and supporting people that maybe are looking at careers in project management, consulting. So I'm just really honored to be here and wanted to say thank you, it's a privilege. Um, and I'm gonna introduce our moderator, I think it's Violet Poon for the next session. So thank you so much and have a great afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I, I want to echo what we've already heard today, and I do want to thank very much to the Eric team for inviting me to moderate um, this afternoon's session, which is on the path of effective leadership. Uh, before we hear from the speakers, I do want to provide you with a, a little bit of introduction of who I am. My name is Violet Poon, and I have been a supporter of Eric as a mentor in the past and also attended a number of their events, um, and I'm also an HR consultant. So I work independently on behalf of a number of organizations here in the Edmonton area, and I'm very pleased and excited to hear our inspiring speakers this afternoon. Um, I, will, I won't be introducing them. Um, they'll be doing some introductions of themselves and, sh and sharing some uh, stories with you. And so I will ask Maddie who, uh, to, to come up to speak first. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Wow, I didn't expect so many people today. So hopefully I'm not going to screw it up. So um, my name is, uh, well, Maddie. Maddie comes from um, my Anglophone identity. My Francophone identity is Madeleine Ingram. And actually, my actual name is Madalina, which nobody can pronounce. Also, there are some special characters that we don't have in English. So um, therefore, I have multiple identities. So I uh, used to say that I have two lives, one uh, before I came to Canada and one um, starting with 2016 when I actually arrived in Canada. So um, I'm from Romania. I'm a Romanian girl, and um, I um, have two bachelors, one in languages and literature, another one in psychology and social work, a master's in psychology, and um, eventually a PhD um, in uh, French language and literature. So I was a journalist for 24 years, and um, I was working for the national radio TV channel uh, in, in my country. And, um, uh, I was also a teacher of languages, and um, I want to show you uh, my version, uh, my Romanian version of the radio station where I used to work in Romania. Uh, I was also in my country an authorized translator and interpreter. Um, I used to uh, do all sorts of translations and interpretations for the Ministry of, Ministry of Justice in my country. I had my own business in my country. I worked on European projects, so I was definitely what we can call a person successful and very much pleased and satisfied with her life. 
You might wonder why in the world I changed all that for Canada. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> when love is in the air, you cannot say no. And I played everything actually on the love card. Too bad, so sad, some people might say. Um, I got married with a Canadian citizen who never wanted to leave his country. Uh, he had a very good position in Canada, obviously. He would not uh, ever in the world, I see some faces that are approving uh, this, this type of version of the story, right? He would never leave Canada. He would never want to leave anywhere on earth but Canada. So eventually my choice had to be made. Uh, so in 2013, I got married with this Canadian citizen, and my proof of love was to leave everything behind and eventually to come to Canada. The hardest decision ever was to leave my forever dream and my forever passion, the radio and TV station. I knew at that time that it's going to be completely, almost impossible to find something in that area, and especially to be a journalist. I said to myself, well, English is not my first language, French is not my first language. Um, although I was bilingual, that, or trilingual with Romanian, right? But you cannot count Romanian, right? Um, uh, I actually felt there was um, no future eventually on, on this area for me. And um, uh, in 2013, I actually submitted my uh, candidacy uh, to do my PhD in Paris uh, at Université paris Escrete. Uh, it took eventually three years to be able to get my visa to come to Canada and eventually I arrived in Canada on February 2nd, 2016. And I know that day specifically, uh, one immigration agent one time asked me, do you happen to know when you arrived to Canada? Uh, just a month roughly, I said, no, I know exactly when I arrived to Canada. On the 2nd of February, 2016, he said, wow, you're very specific. You cannot forget uh, when your life turns upside down, right? That day is, <laughs> it's something that remains stuck in your head. So arriving in Canada, I had to face multiple challenges. So my studies were not recognized. Uh, forget about my experience in radio and TV station. Um, I could never even consider to be a teacher because I didn't have my teacher certification in Canada. I uh, submitted, however, my application at Alberta Teachers Association and I received eventually their final assessment after four years that long took uh, my assessment. It's not happening, relax, like that in all the cases. My case was very specific. Um, all of my professional experience in journalism, in education, in management, in HR, in communication, um, meant basically nothing. And I found myself in a country uh, where is uh, snow uh, more than half uh, of, of, of the months of the year. Um, super cold. I hated Edmonton from the bottom of my heart. I started to accept the fact that I don't hate Edmonton anymore. Um, and um, on the top of all this professional chaos, my relationship with uh, my ex-husband now started to deteriorate and I lived the worst nightmare of my life. And I didn't have any plan B, so watch out girls. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't very smart of me. But anyhow, um, speaking about professional experiences and challenges, I started to work as a teacher aide in St. Albert at the very beginning. I didn't drive. I used to do two hours to get to St. Albert to get to the place and then eventually two hours to come back to Edmonton. And I lived like that on a casual position for one year and a half. Um, I think at the end of the month, my check would be 400 bucks or 500 bucks. That were basically like pocket money. Um, I needed a job like incredibly bad. I was so desperate to have a job that I applied to thousands of, of uh, jobs um, in thousands of languages. I put up everything that I knew. I went and I knocked door to door and you name it, like everything you can think of. And I was wondering what heck is wrong with me, right? And um, I didn't receive any, any answer. Um, and I, I started to, to really think very seriously to go back to Europe. Uh, where I had um, all the time a, a, an open gate. Um, eventually, uh, in September 2017, I applied to be a tutor at Oxford Learning, and um, uh, the position that I had at that moment in time was actually with 16 bucks an hour. 
uh, I saw a job announcement at Accent Emploi. I was reading their board uh, announcement, and eventually I found out this announcement that they are looking for tutors, and I said, okay, I, I really needed a job so bad. Um, at that time, uh, I must say, I was already basically on the streets because I separated from my husband. I didn't have a, a, a job, nor money, nor a place to stay. So that was very uh, challenging um, in, the, in the meantime. Um, eventually, I um, applied also for a contract at La Coalition de Fin de l'Alberta. It was, uh, again, a contractual position. So that's going to be the story of my life for the next four or five years, contracts and contracts and thousands of jobs to make ends meet at the end of the month. Um, and uh, in 2018, I um, applied to uh, Université de l'Alberta Campus Saint-Jean. I was speaking French. And um, with my PhD running, um, I applied to be a lecturer, again, a contractual job, uh, for um, a, teaching, a teaching position, actually, um, in, in education, to teach an education course. Um, in the meantime, because of all these contracts, uh, it was a headache to, to make uh, uh, some money at the end of the month. I was constantly looking for a job. So I would never um, settle. Uh, I would come back home at 9 or 10 p.m. and I would start to uh, do my cover letters and my resumes and applying for jobs over and over and over again. It was like brushing my teeth. <laughs> so um, uh, I eventually signed a contract in January 2018 uh, with Community Options, and I was working again only three hours a day uh, with some um, uh, children with special needs. And um, eventually, in September 2018, there was a radio, a community radio that opened in Edmonton, Radio Cité, and I applied for a position that was at that time... Um, an animator uh, in the residencies, which means a coordinator of um, um, a program for uh, francophone students eventually in the schools of Edmonton. Um, from there, I started to have my own show. Uh, and uh, here is um, um, the poster of our um, of our. Uh, show that we had with Leticia Nadler, at that time the president of La Coalition de Femmes de l'Alberta. It was a volunteering thing that I've done, so I was never paid for this show, but I saw the opportunity to eventually create that Canadian life experience and professional experience that is going to eventually help me in the future, I thought. Um, I also started to work with Centre Collégial de l'Alberta. I eventually finished my PhD in 2020, uh, during the COVID times, um, I took extra years in all that chaos. Um, needless to say that I did not believe that I'm going to ever finish that PhD. Um, and good enough. My PhD was never good enough for Canada. Hello, you have to go back to school, madam. So I went back to school at the University of Alberta. Um, I did one year of bridging program um, in education, in general education. I just finished recently in 2021. Uh, during this time, I was working with the GRIT, with Sandals Translations in Calgary company that I'm still working with. Um, Center for Literacy, I started to work with them in February 2021. I uh, signed a contract with Grant McEwen to be a lecturer for another course in early childhood this time. And I was also working with a private family. Um, I'm an educational facilitator for a young uh, uh, boy, young man uh, with developmental disabilities. So um, it was crazy, and uh, I made sure I, I have written everything on the papers because even myself, I can't remember uh, the timelines <laughs> where I worked and how I worked. Um, so um, eventually, uh, the big click happened in December 2021, when after four or almost five years of applying for different positions with Radio Canada, uh, I was finally called... Uh, on a uh, December day, and I had an interview with Radio Canada Edmonton, and they offered me a position of researcher for a four months contract. And I was like in an awe. I could not believe my eyes that uh, actually these guys called me after four or five years of applying constantly for different positions. Um, eventually, um, in February 2022, Anne, who's right there, found me on LinkedIn. 
because LinkedIn is very important. So I did put a lot of emphasis in what it means, my you know, uh, professional image going out there and selling whatever I knew how to do and so on and so forth. So she approached me on LinkedIn and she was uh, asking me uh, if I'm interested to be a consultant, a uh, community consultant actually for uh, the province of Alberta on a beautiful project um, called Moril. Uh, and if you want to know more information, there is the booth we have right there. We can um, offer you more information on what it means. I'm going to have a video for you in a few uh, in a few um, uh, moments when I'm going to be finishing my, my presentation and uh, yeah I started to work with them with Radio Canada Montreal on Moril and uh, it's been a year and some months right now that I'm, I'm with them and um, I also signed a contract with Université de l'Alberta Campus Saint-Jean in February uh, 2022, where I am the Student Affair Co Affairs Coordinator um, for, for students, obviously. Uh, and um, so on and so forth. I have another contract with Institut Guy Lacombe um, on uh, parenting workshops. I uh, do teach French and English with Center for Literacy. I do teach um, English as a second language. And um, I've been volunteering. I've been volunteering a lot to festivals, to all sorts of companies, um, to Development and Peace Canada. I took all the possible workshops available at uh, Alberta Works, IRIEC at that time, and Braden Institute. Um, I would try to be present all the time in the community, uh, both Francophone and Anglophone, to eventually, um, uh, to eventually uh, get myself out there and to um, to eventually uh, yeah make connections because that's really important. And um, if you love what you do, like really really love what you do, it's impossible to not make things work at the end. However, uh, the path is long, and sometimes the difficulties are really really uh, huge struggles. But um, uh, if you have found your purpose in life, and I did find mine eventually when I was in my country, do not ever, ever give up. Because um, your dreams are important, and somehow, someday, love always wins. In fact, love eventually rocks. So thank you so much, and um, we are going to watch a video uh, of Moril application. Uh, it's actually a free tool for you to improve your proficiency in English and in French. Thank you. Hi, I'm Giovanna and I'm Mexican and now I'm living here in Montreal. My name is David, I'm 40 years old. I uh, work in the domain of l'apprentissage des langues, dans le français et l'anglais. When I arrived to Montreal, I didn't speak English. I didn't speak uh, French. It was something new. I was really shocked when I just arrived to Montreal. And I was really scared about the situation. Like, what I'm doing here? Like, I don't even understand what's going on around me. And I didn't think at the moment like I was capable to learn a, a new language. Well, how did I discover Moril? Well, it was really through my network, uh, the network I've established through uh, my language learning and language training career. I have to say, I was very impressed at not only the concept, but at the product itself. I really want to feel myself like welcome. So one of the ways that I can do that is learning, like the, the language, the French, the English. I know it, it will be difficult, but I was sure I can do it. Who would be the best target audience uh, for this tool? Uh, from my perspective, well, really it's for anyone. Anyone who's looking to build up confidence, maybe uh, resilience in their second, uh, second language, and to learn to appreciate uh, not just the language, but the culture. And culture cultures that come with uh, with every language so with moril is just so easy to learn when i'm on bed i'm relaxing myself i just use moril like it's my escape i love moril because it's so easy it's so fun and i'm learning things in the same time without feeling i have to do it i i, I just do it Thank you, Maddie, for sharing your story and c coming today. It sounds like you have a very busy schedule, so thank you very much for sharing your story. Uh, next, I would like to invite our next speaker, Fahid. Come up. Uh, 
Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Well, first of all, I should thank Eric to give to providing us the opportunity. So, like, especially myself. So, like, back in 2015, I started um, my interaction with Eric. So, in that time, they, I, we part, like, my wife and I, we were like both PhD, and we participated in different events with Eric, and they introduced us the mentorship program. So it was amazing, but when I started my full-time work, then Elena approached me and she asked me to start my mentoring role to give back to the community. So what I'm trying to tell you guys, uh, like I, I, I'm transportation civil engineer by trade, so I, I exactly I had the same problem like many of you that I was talking today, like dealing with the APEGA, getting your PN designation, or finding the job. So even though I had my PhD from UK, I had the same path, the same difficulties in finding the job. It was not like different than you, and also registering in APEGA, getting my professional engineering designation. So, but I tried to transfer some of the key tools that they are needed to like to get to your like dream job, to your like improve what, what, whatever you want to do. So when D Dalibo like presented virtually, I like his style of communication, his body language. It was very strong. It was coming exactly from his heart. So after that also Azume emphasized on communication which is really important. You should show your passion like with your body language, like how, how do you want to communicate? So that was one thing. Another thing that I noticed when media presented as after that, one of the ladies asked that like when we move here as an immigrant, we should start from scratch. So I don't like that term, that analog. So we don't start from beginning. We don't start from the zero. So we, like after that, Nilma kind of used transferable skill. We always have a lot of skilling back home in, in our previous country. So when we come here, we should be smart enough to Canadianize all those skills. So they are not mostly the technical skill, probably they are the soft skills. So it depends on ourselves. If we wanted to take the shortcut, we should Canadianize those skills. But if, you, if we want to start from zero, it's up to us. You guys can leave whatever skills or experience that had behind, start from zero, but it's not right. So like change your mindset, say that, okay, I come to Canada and I want to use those, tra like transfer those skills, use those skills and start my dream job here. So let me start here with my, with like my own story, like, story. So my wife and I, we landed in Edmonton on 25th of February in 2015, when Edmonton Street was like covered with snow. So guess what? In that time, what was my first priority? My first priority, even when we were flying, was coming to the Alberta Global Talent Conference of 2015, 2015 which was going to happen in March 3rd. So I had a lot of ambition that, okay, I'm going there and I will find a lot of network and like start my kind of my, my journey to the, to, toward my vision. So yeah, it was my first place that I came after landing in Canada. So like many of you, I was there, uh, I talked with a lot of friends and I, I still have some some colleagues and friends that I find from this conference in, back in 2015, like seven years ago. So from the early days of our settlement in Canada, I realized the value of networking and volunteering in Canadian societies. Considering that I had no network in my new country, I needed to create some new experience by meeting new and enthusiastic people to expand, to build my network. So. I looked around and I discovered that, as Daribor said, 
don't focus on your immediate community. Because I, I, I come from Iran, my mother, my mother tongue is Turkish. I was a part of the Turkish Azerbaijani community, Persian communities, but I didn't like stuck there. So what I discovered, I discovered that I should go beyond those communities. I started getting involved uh, in our community league. In that time, we were living around the Stratcona, all the Stratcona community, like around the White Avenue. So I, I, I went in one of the evening to the old Stratcona community league. I like, I, I, they, they had AGM. So then one of the lady in that time, so asked me, you come to put your name forward. I said, oh, for what? He's, she said that we have some opening, some 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 um, post, some role that there there is no volunteer. I said okay, why not? So then I got elected in our like to our board of like executive board of the community league in all the circle. I was there for three years. So you guys see the logo of different organization that I was volunteered with. So after that, in 2019, we moved to Allendale. I was president until last week in Allendale Community League. So, and I mean, I discovered that I should go beyond and volunteer in the community level and neighborhood level, plus in my professional organization. So, and also like I volunteered for a few community garden because my wife comes from the agricultural background. So she was interested in like growing our own food. So yeah, we went to the community garden and we were part of the them. So from there, also I started volunteering with the like the the professional organization related to civil engineering mostly. So the first organization that I started with was the Canadian Society for the Civil Engineers (CSCE). So you might most of you guys know that they have the Edmonton section, like other engineering professional section, like PMI. All those organizations have their own Edmonton branch and Edmonton section. So in that time, I approached to their um, chair, and he, he invited me to one of their, their board meeting. So they were very welcoming and very friendly group. So I... I I just appointed as part of their executive board. So their door was always open to, to the new member. So I was with them like for, for a few years until I, I, did, I was appointed to different positions. So after that, I moved to other organization as a volunteer. So another organization that I was and am volunteering with is APEGA. You most of you know, if you are an engineer, you know that in like Alberta, the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscience of Alberta, APEGA. So I was volunteering with them. I was past chair for, past chair of the Edmonton branch. So um, and like I even I went beyond this professional volunteering to expand my, my, my network. So I, involved in, I, I volunteered a few months with the EPL, Edmonton Public Library, and I volunteered with some sport activity with the triathlon team in, in Edmonton. So, and some like social activities, social advocacy group, like as you see, like development and peace advocacy. From each of this organization, I found a good connection that I'm still in contact with most of them. So volunteering helped me to build a strong network by knowing different people and getting familiar with Canadian work environment and culture. Once I got involved with any of our mentioned organization, they provided me the opportunity to learn from them, be a part of their team, which led to expand my own network. Beside that, volunteering sharpened my leadership skills, broadened my knowledge about my new home and helped me to use mentorship support. 
investing time in any of this organization empowered my resume and opened new windows for future career and even changed my vision for my personal life in Canada. Even now, after like years of the professional work in Canada, when I go to the, like when I apply to the new position, like always we talk in some of the volunteer activities, different organizations that, because they, they are usually like the cold call that you always can, like ice breaking talks that you, you always can bring forward. So it helps me a lot, even more than my own technical background. So, and now after so many years, I keep using the same strategy, volunteering and networking. Why? Because these two are the key tools for any immigrant to succeed in Canada. I mean, it's not only for now until you find your dream job. After that, even you should keep, keep like expanding your network, volunteering for your organization, for your professional organization, or for your neighborhood. So these two help me like personally to, they, they help me to learn more about values, assumption, and expectation of the industry. If you are an engineer or geoscience, geoscientist by trade, start your volunteering and networking now. There are plenty of opportunity on the APEGA website that you can apply, you can register. Even when you are not PN or EIT, you can volunteer on this, those positions. So, and other organizations such as, as I mentioned, like PMI, ITE, IEEE, CSC, etc. Plant numerous organizations are around. Their doors are always open to you. Just make sure you knock on those doors. If you don't, you will miss the opportunity, the great opportunity, honestly. If you do so, you and the organization, both of you will benefit mutually. Not only you, even the organization will use your time and your knowledge to promote their activities. You will obtain a lot of knowledge about, about the engineering industry here in Canada and how the projects are executed and managed. You will learn what is needed in the market and what skill you need to work on, to what skills like you have uh, but you want to improve them. And what standards, codes, policies, regulations govern the, your industry? You will enhance your career development and your resume. You will gain valuable technical leadership experience and you will find your potential industry partners and future colleagues from those volunteering. In addition to ongoing volunteering and networking, start apply, applying for your designation with APEGA. Like I see most of the engineers, new engineers uh, come from Canada, they say that, okay, we can apply later, but it's not the right approach. Ap like when you, like when you land in Canada, even before that, apply for APEGA. Like I applied for APEGA even before coming to Canada because I saw, I, I went to some of the job mark, job, job website, job, job fair. So I saw they asked for PN. I Googled and I saw that, okay, what is the PN? I saw that I should be professional engineer. I started applying for APEGA two years before coming to Canada. Even I, in that time, I didn't have my permanent residence, but I apply, I started my process. So when you are APEGA member, you will be able to participate in the events and be in touch with other pairs, which will result in enhancing your professional network. Become a member of the association in your field, of, in your field of engineering, and join their committees, industry mixers, presentation, mentoring, and coaching program. This will provide you with the opportunity to gain more knowledge about your dream job and career paths because you are here to contribute in economic growth of Alberta and Canada at large. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vahid, and thank you very much for highlighting the importance of volunteering and networking. I also cannot emphasize it enough as somebody who 
does recruiting and looks at many resumes and speaks to job seekers, um, it is very important to look at volunteering and how you can do that, not just to give back to the community, but also an opportunity to learn new skills, use your skills, and, um, and also meet new people. So thank you very much for highlighting that. Our next speaker is Evangeline, so I'll ask her to come to the podium. Hello. I know probably we're getting that lunchtime sort of lol, so I'll try to maybe, I don't know, spruce it up, maybe do a dance for you. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> That'd be awkward. Um, but did want to uh, definitely say, you know, thank you to, to Doug and Elena for inviting us here to participate again today. We uh, have been coming to this uh, conference for a number of years or doing it online like we had to the past couple of years and um, love participating in it. It's a great opportunity to connect with all of you and, and certainly provide uh, guidance on how how to get your first role here in Canada. And so we're always happy to you know, continue that conversation so you can find any of us on LinkedIn. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I have my colleagues over in our booth, uh, Janari and Nathan. So please don't hesitate to connect with them um, in the break and they'll be happy to, to speak with you further as well. So, and maybe if I, kind of further to, uh, to Maddie's, um, you know, when she was talking about different versions of her name. So my anglicized name is Evangeline, but en français, Evangeline. So whenever I hear someone actually say Evangeline, I usually stop dead in my tracks because I think it's my, my grand-mère because uh, she was one of the only people that ever called me that. Um, but so, yeah, so even uh, us Canadians have different versions of our names as well, depending on where we come from in this great, vast country. So this afternoon, and let me see if I can advance this. Oh, look at that, awesome. This afternoon, I'm gonna be walking through with you how to find a job and succeed in this dynamic post-pandemic workplace of today, because boy, oh boy, have things been shaken up. So um, we have, you know, Robert Half has been doing this for over 70 years. We are the world's largest specialized recruitment firm and consulting firm all meshed into one. And uh, we have never seen a marketplace like this. Um, so the pandemic has created quite a legacy. And so I'll, I'll work, walk uh, through with you some of the trends we're seeing from an employee perspective, from an employee per, uh, employer perspective, and just maybe give some tips and tricks in terms of how you can navigate it based on what uh, we've been trying to learn along the way as well. So with the uh, shifting employment landscape, now is an, is an excellent time to be evaluating, evaluating your career situation and exploring job opportunities, whether you're looking to work remotely, on-site, or hybrid. And one of the most significant effects of the pandemic on the workplace and hiring landscape has been candidates' expectations around working remote, hybrid, um, having flexibility even in their, their work schedules, uh, not only where, but when they work. Um, and we're also seeing ultimately that really where those expectations are lying is, you know, people are really actively looking for opportunities that are meeting their needs to balance that professional and personal life. Because the pandemic, I think, really brought to light for many people that, you know, you can have a personal life outside of your job, uh, which for many years, I think some of us forgot. Um, we just, all we did was work. Um, so the pandemic really brought that to light and people aren't wanting to lose it. So we're trying to figure out how to make that, that balance. Another consideration is different people work better in different settings. So some people need to be in the office to be effective, uh, particularly those extroverts out there who don't wanna be by themselves all the time. Um, but some introverts like me, um, I'm, I'm an introvert for sure, I don't mind being by myself sometimes. So, um, so some people work better uh, alone as well. So I think what's great about the options now of you know, having some of that balance is that people can find that place that they are more productive in, uh, which we wouldn't have had that opportunity in the past. 
So let's look at what our surveys are saying that employees want most. So 60% want a fully remote position. 57 want a remote optional position with flexibility on where to work. And then 50%, which is almost related to the 57%, but they're preferring that hybrid position. Now, we are seeing the majority of roles are more of that hybrid scenario right now. Um, and, and we'll see how that continues to change uh, over time. So managers. And, and, and leaders in organizations also have their own expectations on whether employees should stay remote or return to work on site. And as you assess your career strategy, it's really helpful to, to understand where their heads are at too. So we're seeing 55% of managers will require employees to work on site full time. And so we've seen this more in certain industries. Um, some are we like to call them old school, and they like to just be in the office all the time. Uh, some are a little more flexible. So, and, what, and interestingly enough, we're also seeing more of a push. I'm going to say, you know, over, even this year, organizations wanting people back in the office more. So they're still going to give you that hybrid option, but they want you in the office more like three or four days a week versus maybe two. So we'll, again, we're going to see how this continues to play out. Uh, what's coming? Oh, there we go. And then we see 44% of senior managers are supporting long-term hybrid schedules. So we still see there is that support, and, and predominantly because managers are, are absolutely acknowledging that if you want to retain and attract talent, you, you have to have some flexibility in your schedules, because otherwise it's just too hard. To, uh, to really attract people or retain people to your organization. We also see larger companies with a thousand or more employees tend to be more flexible. So that's something to consider too when you're looking at your strategies. Now, we're also seeing that another point to keep in mind um, when it comes to recruiting and onboarding remote staff, employers are looking for candidates with skills and attributes essential to working virtually. And we've, you know, I've heard some of these terms actually discussed throughout some of the presentations today. But communication is one of the predominant skills that people are looking for. And, and it's not just, you know, how well you might speak English or how well you write English, um, because that is going to be generally, other than maybe some French as well, depending if you're working for the federal government or the Faculty Saint-Jean. Um, it's, it's also just how how good you are at having mindful communication, keeping people updated on what you're doing, being open, transparent, authentic in your communication. Because in the virtual world, communication is actually more important than it has ever been. Because when we're standing or right in front of each other, we can read each other's body language, we, we can get a sense of where people are at, when you're on a computer screen, it's, it's really hard to do that. So, and particularly when the only time you see them is when you dial them up on MS Teams. Otherwise, you don't see them. You just see a computer screen. So you need to very mindfully watch people's cues. You have to watch, watch how you say things um, to ensure that people don't misinterpret you the communication is really, really different in a virtual world. We also see initiative because, again, you're on your own a lot. So you have to kind of, you know, be like, okay, I don't know how to do this, but I'm going to figure it out because you don't have people sitting next to you to help you. Um, problem solving also comes into that. And then collaboration because, again, you have to have mindful collaboration uh, because people aren't around you all the time. So you're going to have to make a point of figuring out how do, how do I reach out to people? How do I get people involved? You have to be creative and very innovative that way. Eh, no. Got to push harder on the button. Um, so some professionals have also had a shift in perspective due to the pandemic. They want to know that companies they work for are aligned with the principles that they believe in. And, and I think 
I can't remember who had kind of brought this up a little bit in their presentation, but our data shows 27% of professionals prefer to work for an organization that better aligns with their personal values. And three quarters or 75% would leave a company who, whose values did not align with their own. And, we, and again, we have never seen this before. Um, you used to see it in certain segments or um, like particularly I'm gonna say, I don't mean to be gender biased, but generally the younger generations coming into the workplace were a little more aligned with this. But now after the pandemic, we see it in all generations. So again, something that's you know kind of unprecedented. And in addition, corporate programs most important to workers are employee well-being, 72%, and recognition at 53%. So DEI, or diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I know that <laughs> uh, Manuka talked about that as well, has become a key program and journey that organizations are undertaking as they see the critical importance of their employees feeling safe, valued, and they have a strong sense of equity and belonging. These values contribute to a strong corporate culture, which not only benefits the employees, but the organization and society as a whole. You should be able to see on companies' websites, particularly publicly traded companies' uh, websites, because they have a really uh, stringent, robust, <laughs> even more robust than ever before, uh, reporting requirements. So they will outline all of their diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives. Uh, for example, Robert Half, we are a publicly traded company, and we have a whole section, we have a report, we outline a number of different things that we're doing on our DEI journey, as we are heavily, heavily committed to that as an organization. So as you look to find organizations that you want to work for, and you want them aligned to your values, check them out on their website and see you know, what, what are they doing in the community? What, what are they doing from a DEI perspective? Because that'll help you see if that's an organization you even want to work for. Uh, now, as you look for a new career advance in your current organization, as mentioned earlier, what are some skills that you need to look at? Now, soft skills was already touched on a couple of times by some, some folks, so we're just going to dive into this a bit more because the soft skills, again, really, really critical. So well-developed uh, soft skills have always been an important quality for those seeking to advance in their career. So again, in leadership, um, and, and Azumi touched on this, like it's, it is really, really important that you have strong soft skills. But the need to have them in fields not traditionally thought of as customer facing have been accelerating for, for decades. Because, um, you know, there used to be the time when, you know, it was okay with an accountant if they had their little green visor and they were stuck in the corner and they never talked to anybody, that was okay. Well, those days are long since over. Um, I, and I am an internal auditor, by the way, so I can kind of chuckle at that because I can only see myself with my little visor. Um, and that's largely because, you know, of the interdepartmental uh, collaboration piece that we see in organizations now. Organizations are a lot flatter than they used to be. Everybody relies on everybody. Everybody everybody wears multiple hats because none of us have just one job anymore. Um, so so interdepartmental uh, collaboration is really, really key. And also, you know, in a lot of cases, people are being required to explain things to people who have no idea about that specialization. So speaking of engineers, if an engineer comes in and tries to explain something, well, you have to explain it in plain language sometimes because the other people in the room may have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. Accounting's the same way, technology, absolutely. Um, so you have to learn how to, again, that's communication as well. And, and so really where we see the soft skills um, accelerating is because of COVID-19, because of the pandemic, uh, as we you know, are rolling into this post-pandemic world, your teams are spread out geographically. You might or might not be in the office. So they're being tested like they've never been tested before. So let's take a, even a quicker look at um, a couple of some of the key ones that we see right now. So we've talked a lot about communication, uh, a few of the different speakers, because career progress now depends on how good you are at getting your message across and avoiding miscommunication pitfalls. 
These are much more likely in a remote or virtual environment, which in where interactions might lack, again, that one-on-one -on -one, uh, building of rapport and personal aspect. Another soft skill that has increased in importance and shouldn't surprise you is people's ability to adapt to change. So adaptability. Over the past few years, change has been the name of the game within companies as they continue to adjust to new ways of serving customers. And some new strategies have succeeded and others have not, uh, they failed. And this trial and error process has all but guaranteed that people need to develop a flexible mindset. And this is not gonna change. Our world is just full on digital transformation. We got transformation going in all different sectors. Our world is, is it's gonna be changed. And so people need to just be able to roll with the punches. It might be uncomfortable, but just, just, just do it. <laughs> and that just goes for everyone, right from people entering the workforce right up to the senior executive. And it's hard because change isn't always something that's easy for everyone. And if you've worked remotely, you already likely know all about uh, video conference and chat apps and all of those good things. And that's definitely an area that you better be comfortable working on and working on very effectively because those aren't going to be going away either. Now, beyond communication and adaptability, there are many other soft skills you can develop that will help you in a remote or in-person working situation and as you progress throughout your career. Now, in red, I've highlighted four of some of the key ones um, that as recruiters, we often hear most from our clients that they wanna see. So again, comfort with change. So there's that adaptability piece. Communication, both written and, and verbal. Emotional intelligence. So really, again, the virtual world has made this, you know, bigger than ever. Um, because again, you have to be able to read cues. You have to be very, very sensitive to what, you're, what the person you're t communicating to is feeling and thinking. Um, because words have a tremendous impact on, on individuals. And so you really, really have to think that through now more than ever. Problem solving, again, because you're going to spend most of your time by yourself um, in, in this world. We're going to kind of be all over the place, so you got it. You, you're not going to have that hands-on uh, ability to lean on somebody some, a lot of the time. The next thing is new technology is likely to appear more quickly. So um, really, we are just seeing the, uh, the change and transformation in technology now is just insane. Um, I know even at Robert Half, we've essentially become our own little tech company as well. So we've, we've created our own artificial intelligence. We, you know, we've, we've created all these different things. And for people like myself, who I'm, I'm going to absolutely be comfortable in saying I'm not tech savvy, I'm getting a headache from all the constant changes that are being thrown at us. But that's just the world we live in now. And so the more you can get comfortable with technology, again, adapting to that change and just embracing it, the more employable you are because it's the reality of our world now and, and unfortunately not gonna change. Now, for all the IT folks out there, you're like, yay, um, because that means you're gonna be employed for a very long time. And we're all gonna be leaning on you a lot. Now, another thing to take a look at is increasing your vis visibility, because as you map out the skills on your career path, potentially even within a remote or hybrid uh, workplace, how do you get ahead in the organization if management isn't seeing you on a regular basis? And this is often a question we get, even from leadership. How do we promote somebody we don't see all the time? Because we don't know kind of, you know, how they're doing. So making yourself more visible to your boss and senior management has long been a career development strategy, and it still is, but now the tools and processes around it are a bit different. So one way to do this is to continue showing how productive you can be. You want people to be wowed by how much you accomplish, regardless of whether you're working at your office or you're working remotely. So however you need to be able to communicate that to your team, to your upline manager, really, really critical to, to do that. And, and again, do it on, in a very um, regular and mindful, mindful way. 
Another opportunity is to connect with colleagues and your manager online or offline. So if you're, if you're going into the office a couple of days a week, make a point of going to, to your manager's office. Make a point of going out for lunch or coffee with colleagues. Um, because that way you're having that interpersonal uh, connection, you're getting an, an opportunity to update, but you're also building rapport and relationships. People get promoted in companies because they build relationships. They demonstrate that not only can I technically do the job, but I have the right soft skills um, and I've got the right stuff. And the only way to do that is if they know who you are. So you need to be very mindful of that. Um, all right, so, and then assess your marketability. So in closing, some items to look at if you're wanting to move into a new industry or career. And I know I've talked to a few people today who have been kind of looking at that. So not only are your technical skills valuable, but your soft skills you've developed over the years can be instrumental in helping you branch out into new areas. And I think we've heard that over and over and over again today. Do not uh, underestimate the importance of those skills. What we also recommend is just take a, you know, if you, if you want to do an assessment, list out major projects, list out, list out major accomplishments you've had in your past career over the years. What skills did you use to bring these to successful completion? And then take a look at what you could maybe transfer from that into, you know, maybe that new industry you're wanting to look at. Informational job interviews, in-person meetings, um, you can still do virtual coffees as well. Uh, just the op uh, you know, opportunity to connect and build that network. And I know that's been talked about uh, as well. Lots of online resources for you to, to leverage, um, to continue to, to build that network and build your career. There are many factors you may decide to include in your career plan when looking for a new job or entering a new field. So make sure your reasons are also based on long-term goals. And you may have seen a lot of uh, a talk uh, lately about rage applying. So people get angry and they're like, I'm out of here. And then they're going and applying all over the place. We highly recommend not doing that um, because nine times out of 10 when you do that, and I've been a recruiter for almost 18 years, you go from the frying pan into the fire, guaranteed. You're going to take a job at a company exactly like the one you just left. So just calm, rational, take a deep breath, go for a walk. You know, you might have to put your parka on because winter doesn't seem to want to go away. But just take a walk and then determine what your next steps will be. But if you do want to move on, you do make that decision, just put things to the reality test. Um, and, and really, really look at what options are out there and what, what, is a, what is a realistic game plan. And another point that's been discussed today too is contract work. So if you have the opportunity to look at contract work, that sometimes is a great first step into a new career. You can learn lots and, um, and, and sometimes they keep you because things are working out so well. So never underestimate the power of, of good contract work that you can find. So that concludes my discussion today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Evangeline. And I'll just give an example. We've been talking a lot about the importance of soft skills and communication skills. I'm actually recruiting at this time a director of finance position for one of my clients. And definitely we're looking for t the technical foundation, but it's just as important to um, for that individual to have effective communication and soft skills. So can't echo that enough. Uh, I believe I'm going to check with Elena. Do we have time for a couple of questions? Two questions. So there is a, a microphone there in the middle. Um, what I'll ask is if you can keep your questions down to just one question a person, then that would be great. And a short introduction if you'd like as well. Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Kai. Uh, and I wanted to say thank you so much everybody and especially the panelists. Um, thank you so much for sharing your experience. Um, I wanted to say, please, <laughs> I am a very shy person. <laughs> um, uh, Madeline, uh, thank you so much for sharing your experience. I, I thought that I, you were just telling my story. It was exactly <laughs> like that, coming to Canada 
for love and uh, well uh, hopefully i won't be uh, uh, having those challenges like uh, having uh, um you know to leave my my house or uh, problem with my husband but the other things that you mentioned i just i have lived all of those so thank you so much for sharing uh your experience because I, it made me feel that I am not alone. So yeah, thank you. And so for all of you three, um, I have some questions that you said just one, but I just would try to keep it like two, maybe two. It's just a, a one that it comes to two. Uh, and my question is, uh, Evangeline, I, I think that you speak my language, you, um, you talked a lot about numbers and statistics, and um, my question is, if you have any statistics about the minimum years experience a, a, a employers are looking for, uh, because I've seen a trend in all the job postings that is, I, I've seen, most of them require a lot of experience. I speak for myself, I came to Canada just after finishing the university, so I found myself like, well, if I wouldn't have 10 or 15 years of experience, I would be in high school. So uh, my question for you is, uh, what would be your advice for a person starting out? Thank you. Hello? Oh, wonderful. Um, yeah, so very good question because we get that a lot, uh, you know, because we also go to the universities and all the, and, and like Norquest and Nate and, <laughs> and we get this question a lot. Um, and it is, it can be very frustrating. Absolutely. Um, but what I would recommend is take a look at some of the positions that you're, you're um, applying to because sometimes if you, if you're wanting to kind of get your foot in the door, sometimes you're going to have to take um, a very junior level position or a position that may be slightly outside of what you are trying to get into eventually. So just to give you an example, when I came out of school, um, I had, I came out with an accounting, uh, uh, Bachelor of Commerce, but um, I had no office experience. I had never worked in an office. And of course, I graduated um, when we were in a recession. Not a great time to graduate. So no one wanted to hire me, even though I had an academic scholarship uh, with my marks. So uh, what I ended up having to do was I got a job as a receptionist. But that was my foot in the door into an office. And once they knew my background and they saw my aptitude, then I got moved into accounting. So sometimes you have to be a little bit creative to figure out, okay, I want to work here. What's a really good way to kind of kind of get yourself in there? Um, and But what I have to say, because there is such a talent shortage right now, this is actually probably one of the best times to be in a position to try to find work when you don't have the experience um, because employers are starting to be a lot more flexible about looking at international experience, which is awesome because uh, we work so hard to try to get employers to, to work with that and sometimes it's not as easy as I would like, um, but now, you know, it's, it's working, which is great. Um, and so we also are seeing some employers take people right out of, out of school. Um, so it is a good time, but it, I'm not going to say it's going to be easy, but you might just have to be creative. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Next question. Sure. This is very, very quick. Um, thank you, uh, great panelists. Uh, my question goes to Madeline. Um, sitting there, I was just asking myself, she started her story with saying, I didn't have English, I didn't have French, and here am I in Canada, what am I going to do? And then you hear her going to do PhD in France and all of the contract jobs you were mentioning were all sounding French, French, French to me. So my question is, how did you do it? You got the English you didn't have, got the French you didn't have, and became a tutor in those two. Please explain. Thank you. <laughs> 
Oh, very good question. Thank you so much. Uh, that's actually um, what the majority of people are asking me. Uh, how did I do it? With a very serious discipline, even when I did not have a job. I used to wake up at 6 a.m. every morning. At 7 a.m. I would be out of the door. I would be very connected to um, all the possible organizations for immigrants. And I would be out there taking all the opportunities uh, that were in the community, like real challenges. Uh, I do remember that with my last 20 bucks in my account, I did make some um, business cards. <laughs> and I didn't have anything to write at that time on my business card, just uh, my general areas of expertise that I can do translations, that I'm a, a professor, I, I can do tutoring and, you know, something that I would hand up uh, right there without actually having a job and having a position. And uh, I would sell myself at every single um, um, event. I would just go and I would just say that I'm um, doing this and that and I'm looking for or a position in whatever, I would just uh, tailor my speech in <laughs> in accordance with uh, with the um, yeah with the target and um, um, yeah I would come back at 10 p.m. at night and I would start to do my uh, with a very very serious um, like I, I took it as a job. Looking for a job is actually a job indeed, and we hear that very often that it's actually more than a full time job because you have to tailor your resume, you have to tailor your cover letter, uh, you have to know, first of all, what you need to tailor in order for you to get that job, right? So um, I was very, very serious in, in this type of, of, um, of, of work that I was doing. And I think that uh, kind of looking at looking for a job as an actual job really helped me to build that confidence that I'm out there and I am doing whatever it takes to basically make those connections that I need. And it got to the point that right now I'm going in a Francophone community and I know all these people and eventually with all these or half of them I did volunteer somehow somewhere, which is an amazing uh, opportunity because you basically create those relationships that actually eventually in was speaking about and those relationships are actually more important than um, the actual uh, Canadian experience that you have. So basically the volunteering and being out there trying to sell myself meant really a lot. And uh, if I got tired, oh of course I did, thousands of times. If I would say, uh, I don't care, I'm, I quit, I don't want to do this anymore, I'm tired. Um, yes, but the next day I would do exactly the same, thinking that um, at one moment in time, all this effort has to, it needs to, must be paid off. It's impossible not to, because I put so much time and effort and money and uh, 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 nights that I didn't sleep and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, it was... Um, I'm very ambitious as a person. I think that uh, really weighted a lot in the whole thing and I could not accept the fact that I'm going to fail. So um, it was, I think, some kind of battle that I had to win with myself. And um, yeah, no matter how hard it was, um, I would just take the moment, take a rest, uh, sleep, uh, an entire day, 24 hours, and the next day uh, get back on the track and taking everything from zero again. And eventually, it, everything it paid off in the end. Yes, it took uh, almost six years in my case. Um, not all the, the stories are so bad. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, it took six years in my case uh, to eventually get to a point where um, I, I said that I'm a bit satisfied with what I accomplished. But um, at one moment in time, I actually gave myself a timeline and I gave myself a deadline. I said to myself that if by the summer 2022 it was, uh, nothing really like meaningful is happening from a professional point of view, I'm really like very serious to change something, either to change the province, either to go back to Europe and so on and so forth. And eventually everything happened in December, January. I, I think when you're ready, you really have to put that, that deadline and to set up the deadline for yourself. Like when you know that you achieved a certain level of competence that is required on the Canadian marketplace. So I think I would say discipline, um, uh, determination, and a very strict schedule, like a job. Thank you. 
Uh, we're out of time now to take any more questions, but thank you for the questions. And please join me in thanking all of our speakers this afternoon as well.